Amen. Well, good morning, Storyline, and Happy New Year. It's good to see you. Uh, we have some special people in the room. First of all, we have some guests, and if you're visiting this morning, we want to say we are glad that you're here. We're glad that you chose to worship with us this morning and make much of Jesus. We also have a lot of kiddos in the room, and if, if you're a kiddo, I want to hear you make some noise on the count of three. All right, you ready? All right, one, two, three. Make some noise. All right, that, that was pretty good, but I actually think you can be a little louder. Do you think you can be louder? All right, let's, let's try it again on the count of three, all right? As loud as you can. One, two, three. That was pretty good. Hey, kids, we are glad that you're in the room this morning, and we're glad that you get to worship with us. Hey, out of sheer curiosity, this is not important at all, but uh, who actually stayed up until midnight and watched the new year come in? Okay, yeah, so maybe half the room. That's pretty good. Uh, I, uh, I was planning on watching London's New Year's at like 5 p.m., and then I missed it. So then I was going to go for New York's, and uh, I couldn't stay up till 10 p.m. So I went to bed, my normal 9.30, and uh, so if you did stay up, good for you. Hopefully you got some coffee on the way in. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Uh, it's been said before that an optimist stays up until midnight to see the new year in. A pessimist stays up to make sure the old year leaves. And I don't know where you find yourself this morning. I don't know if you're optimistic or pessimistic or you're just tired this morning. But there is something special, right, about a new year. There's something refreshing about getting to bring out the new calendar and start planning. And, and, and maybe you like to goal set. Maybe you like to make New Year's resolutions. Maybe you're one of those people that roll their eyes every time someone talks about New Year's resolutions. And that's okay if that's you. But there's something fun about just a fresh start and a fresh year and a fresh 2023. Uh, one of the things that uh, our family is in the process of, of doing, maybe you do this as a tradition, uh, in fact, I know you do because I've seen it on Instagram, is like at the end of the year, you kind of take a look back, right? You kind of look back to 2022 and remember all the things that happened and all the ways that God might have shown up in your life. And, and then we also begin to kind of look forward to 2023, like what's God gonna do in 2023? What are the things we wanna accomplish? What are the goals that we have in, in, in front of us? A look back can fill us with gratitude. A look forward can fill us with excitement and hope, unless you're one of the pessimistic people, and then I don't know what a look forward does for you. <laughs> but this morning, that's exactly what I wanna do with you. I wanna take a look back, and I wanna take a look ahead and I want to do that from one of the most remarkable passages in the entire Bible, which is in the book of Philippians. And so if you have a Bible with you, I'd love for you to go ahead and turn there with me to Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 2, uh, and, and I want you to see this, this wonderful passage uh, that we're going to be looking at. Now, uh, some of you in the room are, are new to the Bible, and uh, so I just want to kind of lay out the landscape here, uh, if that's you. Philippians is this letter that was written to the church in a little town called Philippi, and it's filled with all of these remarkable verses, some of which you've probably heard before. Verses like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Like, what a triumphant verse. Uh, or, or maybe you've heard this one, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Maybe you've heard those before. That's in this book. And, and, and this, this letter, this book, was written by this guy named Paul. And Paul used to uh, believe that he was pleasing God by hunting down Christians and persecuting Christians and stomping out this early Jesus movement and trying to uh, really kill any believer he found. That was what he thought would make God happy. And then one day in Paul's life, he had this encounter with the living God, and he learned the truth about Jesus. And overnight, his life, if you know his story at all, his life did this 180, where, where all of a sudden he went from Jesus hater to Jesus follower, and he began not only to follow Jesus, but then to tell everybody he possibly could that they should follow Jesus too. And so you got to love Paul's story. It's a dramatic one. And I think knowing his story and having that kind of in the rearview mirror as we read this passage makes the verses we're about to read that much more striking. 
because he believes these verses, uh, these are the very things he used to fight against and denounce, and now he's convinced the very core of his being that Jesus is the hope for all mankind. And so I just want to start off the new year with you by just reveling in this truth that Jesus is the hope for all mankind. And by focusing our attention on him and putting our gaze on him and allowing ourselves uh, really to, to, to think about just him this morning, because when we focus on Jesus, all of our plans for the next year, all of our goals, all of our, all of our hopes and dreams begin to look a little differently, don't they? Because when we focus on Jesus, the way we look back and the way we look ahead is completely different. And so I want to look at these verses. Let's begin in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 5. And so listen to these incredible words. We're going to actually pause several times through here because there's so much here to unpack. Uh, And we're actually going to make this morning a little bit uh, quicker. So you parents with small kids in the room, just hang on. We'll get there. Uh, But Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, here's what Paul says. He says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Verse 7, instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. These verses that we're looking at, uh, there, there, there's six of them from uh, 6 through 11, are what many of us think are some of the earliest, one of the earliest Christian hymns or songs that have been recorded for us. And, and these, these verses are artfully written to compose this masterpiece of a, of a poem or hymn. And Paul begins it with a look back. And that, that's where I want us to start this morning is just a look back. And at this look back, which is for us 2,000 years ago look back, he starts off in verse 5 by by telling us that we should have the same attitude, the same focus, or the same mindset that is set on Jesus. And and that attitude is one really of jaw-dropping proportions here. Because Paul begins to explain that Jesus existed in the form of God. Now, Hebrews words it this way. I love the wording here, that he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact representation of his being. And this is what we talk about around Christmas time, isn't it? Like we just just did this, that, that Jesus left his place of glory to come on a rescue mission on earth. But here, Paul goes a layer deeper. Which, which I love, he, he says this, he says, Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or a thing to be exploited. And that might sound confusing, but here is what Paul is saying, is that Jesus is the sovereign Lord over the universe. And he was arrayed in glory, he wielded all authority, and he chose to do the unthinkable by leaving it all. He did not take advantage of his high position, but instead he gave it up. Behind me is a a picture of Caesar Augustus. Um, I have yet to figure out what the little naked baby angel at the bottom is, (laughs) so I don't know about that. But uh, this is a statue of Caesar Augustus. He's the emperor in Rome that we read about over Christmas time. So if you and your family read Luke 2, right, and Joseph and Mary had to travel for the census because of Caesar Augustus. This is the guy. So he was the emperor in Rome, and he rose to power. And as he rose to power, he began to make some pretty bold claims about himself. He positioned himself as, quote, the absolute ruler. And he began to wear titles like the son of God or divine Augustus or even savior of the fatherland. Like people worshiped him as Lord. And, and so the emperors, if you study history a little bit, uh, they were not like the, the best behaving crew, right? Like they took advantage of their position and their prestige. They made themselves famous. They leveraged their power and their wealth. And, and really, they were a pretty corrupt group of guys. In my mind, Nero is like at the top of that list. And with every ruler of that day, being uh, somewhat corrupt, but certainly pursuing more power and certainly leveraging all that they could, 
What Paul says in these verses about this king named Jesus is completely opposite what anyone's ever experienced and what anyone would ever expect. Because Jesus does not take advantage of his rank. He doesn't hold on to his comfortable place of of glory in heaven, but instead, he stoops down to our level. Isn't that incredible? Jesus stoops down to get on our level because he wants to be with us. Paul says in, in the words here in this verse that he emptied himself. He emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And I know this is familiar because we, we, we just talked about this at Christmas But I don't want us to miss this, that the king of the universe who spoke stars and planets and galaxies into existence lowers himself to our level, taking on flesh and blood, becoming like us. And of course, at Christmas time, we we think about the manger scene and we think about this this baby and and the the stark reality of, of Jesus stooping down this low is that he became this crying and drooling baby, right? Like the Lord of the universe is a little baby who poops in peace. We're in the middle of potty training at our house, so sorry about the graphic language there. Uh, You can pray for us, though. But Jesus did not just condescend to our level. He went further still, didn't he? And that's that's what Paul brings out here, that in obedience to the Father, In obedience to the Father, Jesus went all the way to the point of death, death on a cross. It's emphatic here, the way Paul says that, not just death, but death on a cross. It's amazing, isn't it, that Jesus went from exalted in glory to the lowest point imaginable, a slave's death as a criminal on a Roman torture device. And to think that this was God's choice before he ever created the world, before he, ever, uh, b- before he ever made anything, light or dark, ocean or land, he chose and planned to send Jesus in this way to save us from our sin. It's absolutely mind-boggling. In the words of a pastor that we know as Clement of Rome from the early church, he had these words to say, and uh, it's one of my favorite quotes. Maybe you've heard it before, but he says this, Oh, the surpassing kindness and love of God. He did not hate us or reject us. He didn't bear a grudge against us, but instead he was patient and forbearing. In his mercy, he took upon himself our sins. He himself gave up his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for the lawless, the guiltless for the guilty, the just for the unjust the incorruptible for the corruptible. And then he says this, oh, the sweet exchange. Oh, the incomprehensible work of God. Oh, the unexpected blessings that the sinfulness of many should be hidden in one righteous man while the righteousness of one should justify many sinners. As we start this new year, I just wanna start at reveling with you in this profound truth that Jesus lowered himself to the lowest point imaginable because he loves you and he wants you. Isn't that amazing? The Lord of the universe not only loves you, but he wants you and he wants to be with you. Like he wants to be present in your life this year. He wants you to draw near to him and for him to draw near to you. He wants to walk with you and spend time with you. And I feel like it's one of those things that we're going to spend all of eternity trying to to wrap our minds around, the fact that this God, as grand and majestic and powerful as he is, he actually cares, yes, about the church corporately, but also individual you and me. So much so that he proved his love through Jesus. He wants to be with you. And what more could we ask for, right? Like what more could possibly satisfy our souls or quench our thirst than to be near to the holy and living God? One of my prayers for my own life as I think about this next year, you can call it a resolution or a rule of life or or, or whatever, but one of the things I'm praying for 
is that I would not just learn things about God this year, and I wouldn't just do things for God, but I would actually enjoy the presence of God. Because it's really easy to do things, it's really easy to learn things, and it's really easy to miss God in the process, and I'm praying that I'll slow down and enjoy his presence every day as he walks with us. I'm, I'm praying the same thing for you. That's a look back from Paul, but now I want to do a look forward. Now, we're not quite looking at the future yet in the next verse, but hold on tight because we'll be there in a second. One of the things I love about this hymn, this song, these, these verses that we're looking at, is that like so many good songs or good stories or good movies, it follows this, this U-shaped storyline. And, and you'll see what I, I mean in a minute. And it works up to this climax. Now, uh, one of our favorite movies uh, in our family right now is uh, the movie Cars, uh, the Pixar movie Cars. Uh, kids in the room, do you like the movie Cars? Yeah. Now, I might, need, I might need your help a little bit. Can someone remind me what the name of the red car is? What's his name? Burger King? McQueen. Lightning McQueen. Thank you so much. I heard you loud and clear. This movie, your favorite movie. That's awesome. Uh, it's one of ours, too. In this movie, Lightning McQueen starts off on top. Like, he's got it all. He's got sponsorships. He's got fame. He's racing in the big leagues. He's got uh, fans. Like, he has it all. And then all of a sudden, he hits rock bottom. And he finds himself in this little dumpy town that no one's ever heard of and no one really cares about. What was that town's name called? Radiator Springs. (laughs) And as he, yeah, the adults are, like, telling me the answers. I love it. I love it. I like the movie, too. And in, while he's in Radiator Springs, uh, long story short, he's given this really humiliating job for him of paving the road, way below the pay grade of a race car, right? And, and so he paves the road, and something happens to him while he's in Radiator Springs. He begins to actually care about the people, can we call them people, about the cars <laughs> that are there. And, and, and so uh, fast forwarding to the end of the movie, he's back on the big racetrack, he's in the big race to try to win the big prize, but he's different. And at the end of the movie, he actually cares more about his friends than he does about winning the race. And it ends with people admiring him more, and he's more famous, and he's more liked, and uh, you end all teary-eyed because it's such a good movie. Uh, And if you haven't seen it, you should probably watch it. (laughs) But the movie follows this like U-shaped trajectory and works up to this beautiful climax at the end. And in these verses, Paul is doing something similar, and you gotta love it. He goes from exalted in glory to the very bottom, uh, as far down as you can go, death on a cross, but then to this mountaintop moment. And there's this beautiful U-shape to Jesus' life and death and resurrection, and it's absolutely incredible. I don't want you to miss it in these verses. So look at verse 9 with me. It says, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Now, let's just pause there for a second. God exalts Jesus from the lowest point imaginable to the loftiest height possible, right? You see the contrast there? And, and what is that high point? It's this name that he's given. It's this name that's above every name. It's far beyond any name or title that Caesar Augustus might have. It's far above any other king or ruler. Look at this again. God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at this name, every knee will bow in in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess. Now let's pause again there. We still haven't heard what the name is. Now, it, it's not Jesus. We call him Jesus, but he's already had that name. He, he's given this new name, and at this new name, all of creation bows down to him, and all of the universe worships him. And so as I'm reading this, and maybe as you're reading this, I'm thinking, Paul, what is the name? Like, tell us the name. Give us the name here. And finally, in this climactic moment, Paul works up and tells us the name. So look back at verse 10 with me. It says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's everyone, by the way. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is, and here's the name, 
Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is drawing attention here to this name and this title, Lord, and this is huge, so don't miss it. Paul is saying that this Jesus who came as a Messiah is not just another prophet, he's not just another teacher, but he himself is God. He is divine in every way. This name, Lord, is is what Yahweh's name is in, in Greek, is reserved for the only true God. And Paul is saying and pointing to Jesus as Yahweh himself. This is God. He is Lord. And so he's, he's saying uh, that this Jesus wields all authority and all power. He is sovereign and he's king over all places and over all things and over every person and over every circumstance in your life. So much so that one day, whether friend or foe, every person will bow. <laughs> will bow the knee. Not, not, in loyalty to, not in loyalty to Caesar or the highest ruler of the day, but all of the known universe will bow in reverence and recognition and in worship before the lordship of Jesus. This is our look forward. Like a conquering king who who returns victorious from the field of battle, this Jesus will also return for us, and when he returns, all of creation bows to him because he is worthy. And so that's our look forward, and that's what we have to look forward to. Two. So what do we do in the meantime? And that's, that's what, I, what I want to spend the last couple of minutes with you, thinking about what do we do in the in-between? How does that make a difference for us right now? The, the truth that Jesus left heaven, stepped into human history, died, and then was exalted in the heavens changes everything about our lives, doesn't it? It changes the way we think about goals. It changes the way we think about the future. Because if all of this is true about Jesus, if it is, then we have hope for the future, regardless of what we might be walking through in the present. Right? We have hope. It means that we have a creator and a savior who actually has walked in our shoes and who who has experienced humanity and who can understand our joys and our happiness He can also understand our sadness and our pain. And if this is true about Jesus, it means that we have a king who is reigning on high, even now, sovereignly, over every square inch of our lives. Nothing catches him by surprise, and nothing happens out of an accident. And so as we think about 2023... Because Jesus is exalted in the heavens, then whatever may happen in our lives this year, for good or ill, God himself will be present in our lives, walking with us every moment. And Jesus promised this, didn't he, at the very end of Matthew. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So what should we do with this? Well, I I have a few takeaways here. First of all, if, if, you're, if you're not a Christian here in the room this morning, first, we're really glad that you're here. We think this is a great place to ask the hard questions and uh, to seek truth, and so we, we're glad that you're here. And, and maybe you're just here because you wanted to start off the new year on the right foot, try out church and come here. Uh, and, and so we're glad that you're here. And I, I want you to see the truth about Jesus and the hope that we have in who he is and what he's done for us in these verses In fact, I also want to point you to the very last word of the paragraph in verse 11. The very last word is Father. Jesus did all of this to the glory of God, the Father. And because Jesus has done all of this, you can now call on God as Father. He he makes us sons and daughters in his family when we look to Jesus and we put our our trust and our faith in him and turn from our old way of living. We call him Father, and he becomes this loving and merciful and gracious and caring and present Father in our lives. And so uh, if that's you here today, you're not a believer, we're glad that you're here. I hope you'll look to Jesus and believe and trust. Hey, if you are a Christian here, I have two other thoughts from these verses here as we wrap up this morning. Here's, here's the first one. It's this idea of serving, that we're called to serve. That Jesus came as the ultimate servant, and he served us. 
He stooped down to our level and gave up everything. And in verse five, it calls us to have the same mindset as Jesus. And so how can we not serve others and give of ourselves to others and sacrifice of ourselves to others when Jesus has given up everything to serve us? And so I wanna, I wanna challenge you as you think about 2023 to find ways to serve. Like, let's be known as servants in 2023. And so just really practically, uh, maybe that means that you find, uh, once a day, try to find a way to serve your roommate or serve your spouse. Or, or maybe once a month, you try to go out of your way to serve a neighbor or to serve a coworker. Or, or maybe for you parents in the room, uh, maybe you can change the mindset, and this is easier said than done, and, and think about your parenting as actually opportunities to serve your children, not just to do what you got to do, right? And I can identify with that. Let's be known as servants in 2023. Here's the, the second takeaway and the last takeaway. Uh, I couldn't think of a different word, so I got the Bible word here, which is abide. Abide. Like this year, what if we slow down and actually enjoy the presence of God in our lives and delight in him and draw near to him? It's so easy to get caught up in other things. And, and maybe you're here and, and you think this morning, man, God doesn't want to spend time with me. Or maybe you think God is against me. Maybe 2022 was a really hard year for you, but I want to remind you this morning that God has already proven his love for you. And just think, God sent Jesus to the lowest steps possible in order to rescue us, yes, but also you. And he rescues you, not just out of hell, he rescues you into a personal relationship with himself. And so this year, what if we slow down what if we're just conscious of the fact that God is with us and he walks with us and he wants to actually be with us? Hey, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna um, celebrate communion together and then we'll sing a few more songs. Would you bow your heads with me and pray? God, this morning as we look into your word, as we look back to what you've done for us, we're reminded of who you are. We're reminded that you are so good to us when we completely are undeserving of it. God, the, the depth of love that you have shown us through sending your son Jesus, who emptied himself, went to the lowest depths imaginable, God, that amount of love is incomprehensible to us. And all we can say is thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving yourself for us. Thank you for rescuing us so that now we can live in relationship with you and that we can call you Father and that you live inside of us and you're present with us and you actually like want us and you want to be with us. And so God, it's in that hope that we are grateful this morning and it's with our eyes set on your son, Jesus Christ, that we wanna begin this new year. Whatever may come, God, help us to look to you and trust you and follow you. God, thank you for who you are and thank you for what you've done. That's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well.